I'm Scott Weichel. You're listening to My Kind of Country here on Fish Creek Radio. Our guest today is affectionately known as T.O. and had a string of hits from 1969 to 1986, which included 11 top 10 singles on the Billboard Country Singles Chart. And some of my very favorite songs, including Gwen, Congratulations, uh, Heaven is My Woman's Love, Send Me No Roses, and I could just go on and on, but I want to get to talking to this great guy. We are very proud to have Tommy Overstreet with My Kind of Country. Tommy, how are you today? Scott, I'm doing great, and uh, I'm going to correct you a little bit, okay? All right. Uh, you took uh, the, the charts from Billboard, which is uh, probably, they call it the Bible of the music industry. And uh, unfortunately, I was on a record label called Dot Records, D-O-T, along with Pat Boone and along with Roy Clark and Hank Thompson, a lot of nice people, but we were considered a, what you call a minor record label, an independent. We weren't one of the majors like RCA, CBS, uh -huh. Capital. And uh, Billboard would not put our chart, chart our records in, in the number one position. And uh, I actually had 26 top 10 records in a row in 12 years with Dot Records seven number ones in, in various trade papers, uh, Cashbox, Record World, and uh, various other trade papers. And uh, I got four gold records for Heaven Is My Woman's Love, sold over four and a half million records worldwide. And, uh, but that's okay. I'm just, uh, my daddy always told me, he says, toot your own horn lest it not get tooted. <laughs> Well, that sounds more right to me. I, I kind of was surprised when I read that, and I thought, well, that uh, we'll go with that. But I'm glad I'm glad you got it cleared up because. Uh... <laughs> well, <laughs> I normally don't I normally don't do that, I, but I'm at the age now, Scott, where I want to try to get everything kind of correct and right. Well, absolutely, and I want to have it correct and right for you here today. By gosh, <laughs> we'll get it. We'll get it right. That's good. <laughs> Well, you've had, obviously, we just talked about that, a stellar career. And, uh, you know, as I listen to your songs, the one, the one common denominator is that every song that you sing, you can feel it, if that makes sense. You can really feel the, the emotion that you put into it. And the other thing that I've always liked about your voice is that I know who it is before, you know, before really the song gets going, I can tell it's Tommy Overstreet. You've got a distinctive sound, and everybody recognizes that voice. And that's something uh, that's vastly missing from music today. Well, back when I was recording all the time and uh, chasing the music charts like Billboard and Cashbox and Record World and the Gavin Report and various others, uh, it was very important to have the identity. Uh, Merle Haggard had an identity uh, with uh, Roy Nichols on guitar, you know? Sure. And uh, uh, George Jones had an identity. Uh, Johnny Cash had an identity. Uh, here I am placing myself with three of the top country singers of all times, but but we, we tried and we really worked hard to maintain an identity. Uh, I kind of fell in a crack between, between hard country and what they call pop country. I was raised in Houston, Texas, which is a huge city. And uh, I got my early training from my mentor and my uncle, his name was Gene Austin. And Gene Austin was, to your listeners, probably a, uh, they think of Gene Autry, the cowboy, but Gene Austin was what, uh, he was like a superstar. He was like the Beatles and like Elvis Presley in the 1920s and early 30s. Mm -hmm. He sold 87 million records. Wow. He wrote a, he wrote a couple of really great songs that 
I'm sure some of your listeners might remember. He wrote a thing called, When My Sugar Walks Down the Street, All the Little Birdies Go Tweet, Tweet, Tweet. And he wrote, How come you do me like you do, do, do? How come you do me like you do? And then he wrote a thing called, Look Down at Lonesome Road, which was in the original uh, Broadway production of Showboat. Oh, wow. And, uh, they later took it out, but uh, it was really a great song and probably recorded by 300 different people. Look down, look down that lonesome road before you travel on. And uh, it's a little early in the morning for me <laughs> out here <laughs> in Oregon. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh so he taught me. I was on the road with him six and a half years off and on, and he kind of gave me the basic, uh, what he called it, boot camp, and uh, he put me through boot camp. I wish I'd have listened a little better, <laughs> but uh, at the time I was a young whippersnapper, as, as we call it, and I traveled to New York City with him in Miami, Florida, and and uh, Las Vegas, he lived in Las Vegas. And during that time, I met some of the most interesting people. I'll send you my memoir, which is a, a published book that I have called uh, A Road Less Traveled. And uh, it's a recent publication. Uh, it's a, well, it's, it's, it's kind of a lot of stories that uh, people that I, had the pleasure of working with and and knowing and and uh, how I met him and why I met him and so forth. Uh, I knew Elvis Presley. I knew his his manager, Tom Colonel Tom Parker. Uh, I met Marlena Dietrich, Mickey Rooney. Uh, the, the list just goes on and on. Right. So I'll send you an autographed copy of that, Scott. Well, thank and you. And you can kind of catch up <laughs> on a little of Tommy Overstreet's history. Well, that sounds fantastic. That sounds like a good read. Tell, tell me a story out of the book. Tell me uh, tell me about the Elvis story. How did you come to meet Elvis? Well, I went to a school in, in Houston called Lamar High School. And at Lamar was uh, an interest. it was an interesting school. Out of that uh, school, a lot of very popular people emerged. I don't know if you remember an actress by the name of Paula Prentice. Mm-hmm. But she was in my graduating class. I'll be there. Her real name was Paula Ragusa. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, a local singer and, and later a, an international singer was in my class, and we were very good friends. His name was Tommy Sands. Oh, wow. Tommy Sands later uh, married Nancy Sinatra mm -hmm. and had a television show called The Singing Idol. And uh, he came to me at, at school one day, and he says, Hey, T.O., he says, uh, I'm playing a show Saturday night down at the Eagles Hall. And he says, That new new singer from Memphis, the Hillbilly Cat, uh, Elvis Presley, is going to be there. He said, You want to go with me? And I said, Sure. So uh, we went. And I would say the audience was probably 100 to 150 people. And we're at the Eagles Hall in Houston, downtown Houston. The stage was about uh, eight inches high and uh, just a, like a little raised area in the, in the front of the audience. People were sitting on, on uh, folding chairs and they had a little snack bar and I stood back by the snack bar. And uh, Tommy says, I'm going to go get dressed for the show. And they had a band, and they were opening with uh, a few numbers. So Tommy came, went into the office and got changed, and he came out. And they introduced him, and he went up. And, and after he went up, the, the stage was, I mean, the back where I was, it was kind of dark. And this young man came up and stood beside me, and... Uh, he said, oh, Tommy, he sings pretty good, doesn't he? And I said, yeah, he does. I said, he's a good friend of mine. And uh, I said, my name's Tommy. And he says, hi, my name's Elvis Presley. Be. And we 
we stood there and talked for a few minutes and and uh, got to know him a little bit. And he was uh, just a heck of a nice guy. And we laughed and cut up and and uh, and it was really interesting. And about a year and a half later, I was in Abilene, Texas. My dad had been transferred to Abilene, Texas. And, and his work, and he worked for the National Life and Accident Insurance Company, which owned the Grand Ole Opry okay. at that time. Mm-hmm. I was raised on uh, Grand Ole Opry biscuits. and uh, <laughs> Martha White so, Flower, right? <laughs> yeah, so anyway, uh, I was at that time, by that time I had graduated from high school, and I was singing on a local television show in Abilene called the Slim Willet Television Show. And Slim Willet wrote a little song uh, that uh, Perry Como had a number one record with. Don't let the stars get in your eyes. Don't let the moon break your heart. Anyway, that was the name of that song. And, and he had several other hits locally. Uh, Pinball Millionaire and uh, Tool Pusher from Schneider. And uh, I was on his weekly television show every Wednesday night. Well, he also promoted country music shows. And uh, Wednesday night, I came to the to do the TV show, and he said, "Tommy, I want you to help me this next Saturday night." He says, "As you know, I've invited Johnny Cash and this new kid, Elvis Presley, and and uh, Wanda Jackson uh, will be there." And uh, it should be a pretty good show. Mm-hmm. He says, uh, Johnny Cash will have the number one record this week with Hey Porter. And he didn't even hardly mention Elvis. But he says, you can help me backstage. And I said, okay. Well, I was looking forward to seeing Elvis, and I was looking forward to meeting Johnny Cash and Wanda Jackson. So I'm backstage at the, the Fair Park Auditorium at that time, it's gone now. It's no longer standing in Abilene. But it was a, a nice auditorium that seat, it, it sat about a thousand people, it had a small balcony, and uh, so it, it held about a thousand people. And uh, so Johnny Cash came in and, and uh, shook Slim's hand, and he said, Slim, he says, uh, I know you want me to close the show because I got a number one record here, but he says, I, I want to open the show. Really? Slim said, oh, you can't do that, Johnny. He says, yeah, I got to, man. He says, I can't follow this kid. <laughs> and uh, Slim said, follow who? He says, Elvis. He says, Elvis? He says, he, he says I just booked him because uh, your office said that y'all, to, y- y'all were doing a tour together. And uh, put Wanda Jackson on here because she's she's doing pretty good. And uh, Johnny says it'll be a good show. He says you'll enjoy it. He says let me open and have Wanda, and then let Elvis close the show. Wow. Slim Slim didn't want to do that, but he said, well, finally he says, okay, Johnny, you know. <laughs> so I'm backstage with Elvis when he drove up in his pink Cadillac. And he walked in, and he said, I know you. He says, your name's Tommy. And I said, yeah, it is. I said, your name's Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> we laughed. And we stood outside by his pink Cadillac. And while he was on stage, somebody sliced a tire on his Cadillac. No kidding. And it made, it made the newspapers, uh, and it's probably still in the archive somewhere, but anyway, uh, we go out, and Elvis was really perturbed, and he said, i got to travel such and such miles, I don't know. He says, why would someone do that? And uh, there was a soldier standing over close to the car, and he says, I did it. And Elvis says, well, why would you do that? He says, I ought to whip you. And the soldier said, well, I'm really sorry. He says, he says, he says, oh, he says I've been gone to... Uh, with the army, and he says, I come, I come home, and he says, all my girlfriend can talk about is Elvis Presley this and Elvis Presley that, and he says, I just got mad. <laughs> he, says, 
He says, can I pay you for the tire? And Elvis looked at him, and he says, no, don't worry about it. He says, I'm sorry about that. And they shook hands, and the soldier boy said, I really appreciate you, man. He says, I love your, love your music. And he walked off, and I looked at Elvis, and I said, you're a pretty neat guy. Yeah. And uh, he was. He was a nice, nice fella. Uh, he later, you know, <clears throat> lived in an ivory tower and uh, had some serious problems. Uh, but he was he was really down to earth and a good guy. Wow, and that's a great, cool. And a great talent. And I assume that's in your book? Uh, yeah, it's in the book. Uh, I left out the tire scene, but... Uh, how I met him is in the book, yeah. That's cool. Well, folks, that's called A Road Less Traveled. Tommy, where can they get a hold of that book? Well, uh, they, if they have a Kindle, they can go on Amazon, and they can uh, download it uh, off of Amazon. It's just called A Road Less Traveled. And if they uh, want an actual copy of the book, uh, of the published copy of the book, they can uh, write my office, which is Post Office Box 236, Hillsboro. That's H I L L S B O R O, Oregon. That's O R. And the zip code is 97123. P.O. Box 236, Hillsboro, Oregon. Nine seven one two three. All right, folks. And that's my office, and they can send a, a check for seventeen dollars. That's uh, fifteen dollars for the book and two dollars for postage, and I'll sign it to whoever they want it signed to, and they'll have a a book called Tommy Overstreet's A Road Less Traveled. Well, that's a, definitely a book to have. We'll make sure and share that uh, information on our uh, pages, too. And uh, folks can contact us here at Fish Creek Radio, too, and we'll have that information for you if you want to get that uh, great book and from I Tommy. Have, I have another book, Scott, that uh, I'm really proud of, It's a, and I'm proud of the other one, too, but I'm proud of this one. It's a hardcover, beautiful, beautiful illustrated book. It's a children's book, a children's story. And uh, it's called The Graham Cracker Kid and the Calico Girl. <laughs> I and love it. Those, those people out there that have little children from age 3 to 9 or 10, uh, this would be a perfect book for them. And they would love it, and they would enjoy the story. And uh, it's called The Graham Cracker Kid and the Calico Girl. Now, that book's a little more, more expensive. It's $21.00 plus $3 postage, so it'd be $24, but it's a beautiful hardcover book, and uh, would love to send that to someone, and I'll autograph that to the, to the person and to their children, and uh, I'll put saddle up, and, and uh, to so-and-so, saddle up and get ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tommy, we were talking a little before we started the interview about uh, some <clears throat> some new music that you're, some new old music actually from the vaults that you're putting out and a couple new albums that you have out. Tell me a little more about those. Well, I have a, I have a new album, uh, a new live album that will be going up on uh, Amazon here pretty soon uh, called uh, Live at the uh, Civic Center in Idaho Falls, Idaho with my band, The Nashville Connection. And it's, uh, it's really a, a pretty good uh, DVD. And I also have a CD, an audio version of that, that will go up. And then I have uh, a new song, new album called Good Love and Feelin', which has 15 songs on it. And uh, I'll be sending Scott a copy of that one uh, very soon, and uh, he'll have that, and you'll be able to hear some cuts from that. I think it's a pretty good album. And uh, then... Uh, I used to be general manager of Famous Music in Nashville, which is a glorified title of song plugger. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I, uh, I, I wrote for the company. I was a songwriter for the company at the time that I was general manager. And uh, I also was recording for Dot Records at the same time. So I, 
I kind of wore three hats at that time. And uh, I was curious the other day about how many songs I had written that were in that catalog. So I called them and, and come to find out there were 25 songs, of which I put together 19 for a new album. And I added a friend of mine's recording. Uh, I produced a song on him. Uh, he, he's, a, he's a bonus track on the album. So there's 20 songs, uh, 19 by me and one by this other fellow by the name of Rubel Jeffers. His son plays uh, guitar for Carrie Underwood. And uh, it's a pretty good album. It's called Tommy Overstreet Originals from the Vault. 46 years later. <laughs> Great. And uh, you'll hear Tommy Overstreet <clears throat> singing as an early young guy. <laughs> <laughs> and some pretty good songs. There's uh, some pretty good songs on there. Well, I'm glad to hear that you have these out. We have a lot of requests for your music, and uh, I'll be the first one to tell you, most of the uh, stuff that I play on the show from you is is off vinyl, so I'm really glad to hear that you have some CDs out, and uh, sounds like you're staying busy with that. That's amazing. You're, a, you're an author and a publisher and uh and uh releasing great music that's that's pretty fantastic i'm glad to hear that well thank you scott I actually I'll, i'm going to send you a third album uh, and it's a new album too it's called back home again and it has 15 songs that i either wrote co-wrote or publish and uh there's some pretty pretty good little songs on there i think you're going to like that too so you'll have uh, if you look out the window, you'll see three three albums coming your way. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, folks, you'll be hearing them on the air, I guarantee it. We'll have lots of Tommy Overstreet to play. That's fantastic. <laughs> I, I want to ask about some of your older songs. And I, I, there's a sure. kind of a common denominator I see in quite a few of your hits. They have they have a lady's name in quite a few of those. You had, Of course, you had Gwen, congratulations, oh. Jeannie Marie. And tell me how that, how that kind of came about. Well, it just kind of happened that way. The Gwen came first, uh, then came Anne, and then came Jeannie Marie, and we did an album called Woman, Your Name Is My Song, because we'd been recording songs with girls' names. And I went out and did Midnight Special on NBC, and the host of the show, uh, I did two of them, actually, and the host for both shows was Marty Robbins. Oh, okay. Um, this is in the this is in my book, but I'll go ahead and tell the story. Marty's introducing me, and he says, "Ladies and gentlemen, here's a good friend of mine, uh, and he sings only about girls. Would you welcome Tommy Oversex? Uh, I mean Tommy Overstreet." <laughs> That's great. And I told him after the show, I said, "My mom and dad are listening to this, watching this show." And he said, "I know." He said, "Isn't that funny?" And he just walked off. He was he was a delightful guy. Marty was a wonderful guy and a good friend. That's good. That sounds like something Marty Robbins would do. You know, I one of my favorite yeah. clips to watch. Um, Merle Haggard did some impersonations back then, and he he did Marty Robbins real good. And, and uh, Ralph Emery had a show on and I, I, this clip. You can see it on YouTube, but. Uh, he and Marty are standing there and, and going back and forth on these songs, and it, and it ends up that uh, uh, Merle Haggard starts singing Marty Robbins, and the look on his face is just priceless, you know. And he was he was quite a great guy, quite a great guy. Oh, yeah, he was. He and he was a lo he loved <clears throat> to do practical jokes. He loved to kid people and and uh, and do those kind of things. He was just a he was a fun guy to be around. <laughs> Tell me about uh, Heaven Is My Woman's Love. One of your biggest songs. Well, I came home. I, I'd been out on the road, and and, uh, and I had to record. Uh, they had called for a new recording session, and and uh, so I flew into Nashville and left my band on the road because we were gonna. I was just gonna fly in and be gone from the road for about two days, and then fly back and meet the band and do do more shows. My bus and my band were traveling to the next next gig. And uh, so I flew in, and uh, uh, my producer and uh, Jerry Gillespie, a songwriter, uh, came over to my house, and they, they had a stack of songs, and we sat there and listened to them. And uh, I picked this one, and I picked that one, and, and uh, keeping in mind, I had to record the next day, so I had to learn the songs that night and record the next day. 
And uh, they, uh, Jerry said, we, we also found a song that uh, uh, he, the demo is kind of a real slow ballad. He said, we want to put a little bit of a, a little bit of a rhythm to it. And uh, here's, here's the song. And so he sang it to me. And I said, that's the number one record. And he said, you think so? And I said, yeah, I think so. And uh, my producer had pitched me a song called Your Love is Like Sugar to Me. And he thought that was a number one record. Well, it, in hindsight, years later, it was never a number one record, but Heaven is My Woman's Love was the number one record and uh, got got me four gold records. Wow. But, uh, and, and it was really interesting. We recorded the next day in the little small RCA studio in, in, uh, in Nashville uh, where Elvis recorded, and, and it's now a, a museum. And uh, I was in that studio once when Tony Joe White recorded his... Uh, Original composition of Pope Salad Annie. I'll be there. Billy Billy Swan <laughs> produced it, and and uh, so anyway, I I sang Heaven Is My Woman's Love. We had ten minutes left on the session, and we hadn't gotten to Heaven Is My Woman's Love. And I said, I said to my producer, I said, Richie, I want to do Heaven Is My Woman's Love. He said, Well, we don't have time. I said, Yeah, we do. So I went out to David Briggs on piano, and I said, David, run through this song one time with the boys, and then we'll cut it. He said, okay. Wow. So they ran through it once. We cued the engineer in the, in the control room, and they started it and played it. I sang it, and I never touched it. I never, never overdubbed my voice. Uh, we cut it in 10 minutes. And it was a number one record. You know, I've heard that from several other artists. They're, they're, you know, they're bigger songs that ended up being cut like that. And it seems to me like a good song when it comes together like that. It's just a meant to be thing, you know. Yeah, it is. It really is. And and I, and I always I always say I'm a producer as well as a writer and 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 a singer. A song will produce itself if you'll let it. There you go. There you go. Ken, this, song, Ken, this song produced itself. Ken Nelson so, said the same kind of thing. He was a, a producer at Capitol for many years. He did a lot of Buck Owens stuff and Merle Haggard, and uh, he said the same thing. He just kind of let the tape roll, you know, and, and just let it be. Yep, yeah, that's the way you have to do it. Well, I'm, I'm holding the album in my hand. I have it uh, right here, Heaven is My Woman's Love, where you're standing up against the barn there. and and uh, not a road from my house at the time. Is that right? Well, there's Is a... That, Brentwood, Tennessee. That was take that was taken, and I had I had allergies so bad that day because of the grass that I'm standing in. It was just driving me crazy. <laughs> I've got I've got that right now. We're kind of in transition up here, getting into springtime, and we get all that mold and stuff from under the snow. And so, if you hear me clear my throat once in a while, I apologize. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Well, there's a song on there that is my favorite. Well, Heaven is My Woman's Love, I guess, is my favorite on the album. But there's another one that I really love, and I play it often on my show. And I, I've, I just can't let the interview go by without asking you about it, because it is one of my very favorites. It's called A Seed Before the Rose. Well, that was, uh, uh, we came out with that as a single. Uh, we had Gwen Congratulations, and then we followed Gwen Congratulations uh, which was a number one record with a song called I Don't Know You Anymore, which was a number one record. And then we decided to do a ballad. And uh, my producer and Jerry Gillespie wrote A Seed Before the Rose. And uh, I loved the song. Uh, it only got to top five. It didn't make it to number one. But that was okay. We we had set kind of a, a precedent that we we wanted to uh, come out with a an emotional heart type song, and uh, we followed that one uh, with uh, uh, let's see, that would have been I think the the, the fourth one was. Uh, uh, I think it was Heaven Is My Woman's Love. Then we did Send Me No Roses and I'll Never Break These Chains and I'm a Believer. And, 
but anyway, so yeah, it it was a it was a, a good song for me, and and uh, a lot of people like yourself love the song. It's, yeah, it's a beautiful and, song. It really is. That's I've re-recorded it. I've <laughs> re-recorded all of my hits actually on a CD that I have called Tommy Overstreet's Greatest Hits. It's on that's on Deja Vu Records and it's on uh, Amazon too. Oh, very cool. Good to have those out there. That's for sure. Well, I'm really glad to uh, hear about all this great music, and I, I'm looking forward to getting to getting all that stuff, and we'll we'll get it on the air. And I can't wait to read the book. I'm I'm uh, definitely uh, you've got my interest peak there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you find it interesting, and it's uh, I think I think it, ha- it shows you uh, the personal side of Tommy Overstreet and my uncle Gene Austin, who put me in the business. Uh, you mentioned a little while ago that. Uh, and my music always sounded so much like from the heart. And uh, he told me, he said, Tommy, he says, he says, if you sing songs from the heart, it'll touch people's hearts. And uh, he, like I say, sold 87 million records. His biggest hit was a song called My Blue Heaven. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and he, uh, he had 31 hits in a row. And uh, he was he was quite a guy. Uh, we lost him in 1973, and uh, he uh, he was also David Houston's godfather. I'll be there. So, so we uh, he was he was responsible in a lot of ways for Tommy Overstreet. He's in uh, the, a lot of stories are about him in the book. And you'll you'll enjoy reading about him and and uh, some of the things he did and some of the people I met while I was with him. Well, that book is called A Road Less Traveled, and you can get that on Amazon.com, or you can uh, send a uh, uh, check or money order for uh, seventeen dollars right to Tommy Overstreet, P.O. Box two thirty six, Hillsboro, Oregon nine seven one two three, and he'll get it to you. By gosh, along with his other albums, check them out on Amazon.com. I think you can go on there and uh, do a search for Deja Vu Records, and uh, those will all come up on there. You did a gospel album here recently too, did you not? Yeah, actually, I've done uh, two gospel albums. I've got one that uh, is a three-CD set called Tommy Overstreet Country Gospel Favorites. And uh, there's 36 songs there, and out of which I only wrote five. But there's uh, 31 classic uh, evergreen gospel songs. Uh, And then... I came back and did another uh, two-CD set called Praising Him Old and New, which is uh, 11 evergreen songs, including I'll Fly Away, Amazing Grace, In the Garden. And then I did 11 original, new original songs, gospel songs that that i i wrote with my friend rick and uh if you uh do you play gospel on your show absolutely absolutely i will send you i'll send you that too you're going to have quite a package coming to you well that's wonderful well uh when we'll get them on the air i'm going to be like a kid in a candy store (laughs) (laughs) well i know I'll i'll send you more music than You'll probably be sick and tired of Tommy Overstreet once you get all never, this stuff. Never, 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 never. I, uh, you have always been a favorite of mine, and it's been an honor to talk to you today. And I know all your fans out there are going to be really glad to uh, hear this interview and uh, get caught up with you again and get some of your great music that you've got out there and uh, have some great memories there. That's what it's all about, and that's what we do here at My Kind of Country. And uh, it's it's been a pleasure talking with you today, and, and uh, it's been, I guess, more of a conversation, but I kind of like it that way. And I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to, to uh, be on the show today, Tommy. Well, bless your heart. Thank you, Scott. You're a good man, and uh, keep up the, the shows. My kind of country, i tell you what. it's uh, To me, country music is uh, from the heart. It tells the story of people that have responsibility in their life. You know, uh, I told a young girl 
the other day she was telling me how much she loved this rock and roll song and this rock and roll song and this rock and roll song. And I said, honey, that's that's good. I said, I was young once, and I said, uh, I like that rock and roll. At that time, it was called rockabilly, and then it became rock and roll. And I said, uh, but I loved it. And I said, we danced to it, and we did all this. But I said, when I got married and had a couple of children, I said, country music fit my lifestyle. And I said, at some point in time, and I said, remember I said this, you will turn to country music because you will relate to country music. You will no longer relate to uh, what they're playing in rock and roll. Well said. Well said. Absolutely. Well, that's why uh, we got folks listening to my kind of country, and, and I'm so glad that uh, you were able to be with us today. And we'll look forward to playing lots more of your music on our show. And, uh, Tommy, anytime you have some time, I would love to talk to you again. You're welcome on my show anytime. And uh, we're going to send you a package. We have a sponsor called Fred Kelly Picks up here in Michigan, and they supply custom-made guitar picks for all sorts of stars, including Charlie Daniels, Zach Brown Band, so very many of them, Tom Brash, my goodness, lots of them. But we're going to send you a nice little gift package from them, too, and we really appreciate you being on the show here. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, look out your window. That package is on its way. All right. We'll check it out. All right, well, we're going to play some Tommy Overstreet for you right now, and uh, you are listening to My Kind of Country. I'm Scott Weichel. Thank you again, Tommy Overstreet. T.O., it was a pleasure. Thank you, Scott.